Okay, well, good. Yeah, you think you would think that uh, after a year and a half of using Zoom, we would be able to uh, <laughs> negotiate all this without any trouble. It looks like we have a good internet connection, so that's good. So um, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this program uh, this year. It really is um, a pleasure, despite the fact that uh, I'm not enjoying the wonderful uh, <laughs> sights and sounds of uh, Yerevan, uh, which uh, is always a pleasure. Uh, but, um, but today I will share with you some of the work that we've been doing for the past few decades uh, related to uh, the biology of Chernobyl. And um, this is familiar to some of you, but perhaps uh, not to the students in the room. And so uh, today's lecture will be <laughs> a little bit on the basic side, but, uh, but I think that should be okay. Uh, so let's see, here we go. All right, well, let me uh, start by a little bit of background. And, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the universe is a very radioactive place. The, uh, as soon as you get uh, beyond the Earth's atmosphere uh, and away from the Earth a little bit, uh, uh, you know, the, the, there's all sorts of different sources of radiation. You've got cosmic rays, the, you know, the sun is producing neutrinos and X-rays, and uh, we have... Uh, neutrons and gamma rays, uh, protons, heavy ions moving at the speed of light. And, uh, you know, in, in space, uh, the, uh, the dose rate, again, is highly variable, uh, but, uh, but, you know, someone traveling to Mars, which, which is what we uh, all hope to do, and certainly Elon Musk hopes to do or to promote in the next uh, few years, uh, will involve a major dose, uh, you know, no one really knows for sure exactly how much it'll be because it, it does vary, but, uh, but in the order of 300 millisieverts for a six month trip to Mars. And so this is uh, uh, pretty significant, but uh, luckily here on earth, you know, we have uh, been incredibly fortunate and, and, you know, some might argue that, that one of the reasons life on this planet looks the way it ha it does, the way it, you know, the, it, it is the way it's evolved is that uh, we are protected in a variety of ways from, from all this radiation flying through the universe. Uh, first and foremost, uh, you know, the earth has this magnetosphere. It has this, this uh, magnetic field that surrounds it, which in effect serves as a deflector for much of the, uh, the cosmic uh, radiation uh, and other, other stuff. And, uh, and so this is, uh, this is really uh, been incredibly important in, in reducing the amount of radiation coming in from the universe to the planet. And, and of course, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the great success stories in, in environmentalism has been, uh, you know, related to the ozone layer, this, this layer of o, oxygen 3, O3, that surrounds the planet. Uh, really uh, is, is very, very effective at protecting us from the most uh, deleterious uh, components of, of, of ultraviolet radiation, particularly ultraviolet C and ultraviolet B. Uh, ultraviolet C being quite high energy is actually, you know, on the edge of the, uh, you know, ionizing part of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum and, and, is, and, 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 you know, will, will is used as a sterilizing agent in many settings. Uh, I say it's one of the success stories because of course, uh, many years ago, a couple, few decades ago, when it became obvious that the ozone layer was uh, being um, attacked by emissions of, of chemicals, primarily CFCs, but uh, other chemicals as well. When it was, when it was you know, when, it, when they figured out the actual issue, uh, the, the planet as a whole pretty much uh, came together to, again, to reduce the, the emissions of these chemicals. And, and, and now, um, you know, the ozone layer is recovering and uh, quite substantially. And, and, uh, and, and really, this is, uh, this is good news, especially for people who live at higher latitudes and higher altitudes. But, uh, but also, it, it does speak to the fact that it is possible for for a um, you know pro <laughs> planetary scale uh, 
political meeting of the minds to uh, to tackle some of these larger environmental problems, of course, which we, we, we which we, of course, face right now in terms of climate change. Anyway, um, the uh, basically the sum total is that uh, the the surface of the Earth in particular would be a much more radioactive place without the ozone layer uh, and without the magnetosphere. And, uh, and it's been argued uh, uh, convincingly to my mind that much of the terrestrial life that we have on this planet, uh, you know, uh, really did not appear until after the ozone layer was thick enough to prevent most of the ultraviolet radiation from hitting the surface. Uh, systems in the water, much less affected, of course, but, uh, and so up to that point, most of the life on the planet was uh, aquatic. Anyway, um, but of course, you know, we're not completely home free. The, the, Earth, the Earth has its own sources of radioactivity <laughs> and uh, uh, along with many other mutagens in the environment, but, uh, but it has its own radioactivity, uh, mainly coming from the radionuclides that are decaying mostly in the soil. Uh, we have uh, quite a number of these, but uh, you know, uranium daughters in particular, uh, are uh, uh, of, of some concern, and and in it, it varies. These vary in in, in the amount uh, uh, and the and the doses associated with them dramatically around the world. Uh, you know, in Kerala, India, uh, Ramsar, Iran, uh, parts of Brazil and Africa, and even France have uh, substantial uh, radiation doses associated with these natural radionuclides and and and, uh, and and it's very clear that uh, although they're not uh, t to the levels that you know tend to induce cancers at least not in in, in a short time period they do have uh, measurable consequences for the populations that are exposed to them uh, we, we actually conducted a meta-analysis of of all the literature we could find a few years ago and published that this in the biological reviews and and again the bottom line is that uh, the uh, the effects were relatively small but significant and of course radon radon uh, a natural radioactive source is the second leading cause of lung cancer uh, I think pretty much worldwide uh, and certainly in the U.S. and and uh, and China so anyway. Uh, you know, other sources of radioactivity in the environment, there, there's, there, there are many. And, uh, you know, of course, we have um, uh, in, 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 in this new age of, of human beings on the planet, uh, the, the age of, of the Anthropocene, as it's called, uh, we have contributed dramatically to the sort of background level of radiation uh, or the background amounts of radionuclides. In, in the environment. And, uh, you know, of course, the age of the Anthropocene, probably, you know, many people, there's a lot of argument over exactly when this started. But, uh, you know, the most significant change, of course, was when, when we moved into, uh, you know, becoming agricultural, an agricultural species. And uh, this is when we started to clear the land and, and you know, planting crops and and, uh, and our population uh, uh, started to increase rather quickly at that point. But I would argue that the, the start of, of the true Anthropocene, the point in time when we were fully capable of, of, of ending life on this planet occurred with the uh, sort of the starting point for that was when we uh, detonated the first atomic bomb, uh, the so-called uh, Trinity bomb, uh, which was detonated in July 16th, 1945. And it followed fairly shortly by uh, a couple of bombs uh, detonated over Japan to, uh, again, arguably uh, helped contribute to the end of the Second World War. Uh, again, a lot of a lot of discussion about this in the history books, but uh, but uh, but this was really the start, to my mind, of the the Anthropocene, the point in time when humans have left an indelible uh, mark that that will be uh, in 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 the layers of sediment for forever. Uh, and of course, over the years, uh, the, um, of the, you know, the atomic powers on the planet, primarily the United States, Russia, and, uh, and, and a few others uh, have detonated a large number of atomic bombs 
um, many of them in the atmosphere. More than 2,000 atomic bombs uh, detonated over the over the past uh, since 1945. And uh, again, uh, initially, many of these bombs were were tested above ground in the atmosphere, and led to enormous quantities of radionuclides spread pretty much worldwide. I think uh, at, at some point, uh, people started to realize that, oh my goodness, that we are, we are, we are poisoning the planet. Uh, in particular, we are, we are exposing our, our populations uh, to uh, this, uh, uh, this, 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 this mutagen in, in a very large way. And, and so uh, most of the atomic bomb testing switched to underground testing. Uh, in the uh, late 60s, but uh, but it did continue, and uh, and like I said, these uh, these 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 tests have left a, a permanent stain in the sediments uh, of the planet, and are in some areas, uh, some parts of the world where the tests were particularly uh, common, uh, uh, still a significant source of radioactivity for the for the populations. Uh, not I think not too far from. From you folks uh, in in Armenia, you know uh, Kazakhstan had uh, a very large test area as well. Um, so we have the the, the radionuclides from from atomic bomb testing. We also have radionuclides associated with uh, nuclear energy, nuclear power. Uh, you know, again, nu commercial nuclear energy was developed in order to uh, to sustain and support the nuclear arsenals of, of the major superpowers and uh, and uh, because they needed a source of, of, of en enriched material for, for the bombs, uh, vast quantities of it. Uh, at one point, there were uh, tens of thousands of nuclear warheads uh, uh, on both sides of the uh, of, of the of the ocean. And uh, <laughs> and so uh, nuclear power plants were needed to help generate the uh, the, the fuel for those bombs, as well as uh, uh, you know, the tritium, the, the radioactive uh, hydrogen H3, uh, that uh, led to the uh, uh, the development of the hydrogen bomb. And so, again, um, these nuclear power plants, you know, people don't really realize uh, that uh, you know, people tend to think that 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 when they're in under normal operations, they're they're relatively clean, and they're certainly relatively clean with respect to carbon emissions with respect to carbon dioxide emissions but but they are not totally clean and 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 uh and let me just say that back up again and say that of course we have uh uh quite a few commercial electricity producing nuclear reactors around the world this doesn't include all the military uh reactors and experimental reactors uh that are also uh, operating, but uh, but again, hundreds and hundreds of them scattered across the planet. And what this graph here, taken from a, uh, it was basically taken from a, it was published in a National Academy of Sciences report about a decade ago, uh, but it was actually taken from an UNSCAR report originally. Uh, and these uh, show some of the emissions of of radionuclides uh, from the um, uh, these various operating power plants here, and I can't see which one this is, but these this is for noble gases. But uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 graphs look pretty similar for the other major uh, radioactive effluents, and and so the good news is that uh, uh, that uh, the amount of these uh, emissions has gone down considerably over time, again with the recognition by the industry that. That these pollutants are potentially a health risk, uh, and uh, and so there's been a lot of attention focused on reducing these emissions over time. Uh, the bad news is that they are still emitting uh, vast quantities of radioactivity. Uh, nobody really knows what the, the the health and environmental consequences are because it, you know, surprisingly uh, has not been well studied. There's been very little funding for any kind of study related to the health. Uh, and environmental consequences of, of operating nuclear power plants. It's, it's really kind of stunning that there hasn't been more investment in this area, but it's not seen as a priority by the agencies associated with this energy uh, who uh, perhaps would rather not know those answers. 
We have other sources of radiation in the environment. This is probably the, the most important one for the average person. Uh, so for the person who doesn't live next to a nuclear power plant or next to the site of a, uh, of a, a nuclear accident, uh, both sources of radiation uh, are increasingly becoming uh, a very significant source of, of dose for, for the average person. Uh, you know, the, the, an average CAT scan, uh, which, uh, you know, many people have many of over the course of their life, if they're, you know, sick or they break bones or they're in car accidents or uh, whatever, it's, it's sort of the method of the preferred method of choice for, for many uh, uh, for many doctors to, to get a, the bigger picture of what's going on uh, in a body. And uh, the, the doses from these machines can, can be, uh, it can exceed the average annual dose for, um, from all other sources. And so uh, these, uh, these medical sources are, are increasingly of interest. And again, you know, we, we, we really don't have a lot of, um, uh, of knowledge about what the long-term impacts are, though there have been a couple of good epidemiological studies recently demonstrating that, uh, for instance, the CAT scan doses are associated with increased rates of, of cancer uh, over the lifetime of the individuals. Another major source of, of radiation in the environment, uh, again, comes from nuclear accidents, accidents at nuclear facilities, and, 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 and of which there have been many, uh, several hundred of them, uh, probably a lot more that we don't know about that, that are kept secret uh, because they occur in military installations, for instance. But, uh, <laughs> and uh, many of you people uh, in, uh, in Europe uh, and Asia have uh, uh, experienced these as well. Uh, but of course, the, the ones that have been most, are most famous because of their worldwide impact primarily uh, and, and, their, and their size have been, for instance, the Chernobyl disaster, which we, we uh, some of us can remember from 1986, uh, which contaminated again vast quantities of, of Europe. Um, but of course, high, you know, the levels are, are highest in and around Ukraine, Belarus, and parts of Southeastern Russia, but also spread throughout Central Europe and, uh, and Scandinavia in particular, uh, where there are measurable uh, you know, Geiger counter measurable uh, um, increases in, in, in the dose related uh, to living in these areas. Uh, the most recent large scale accident, uh, again, in Fukushima from 2011. This is an early map that I, that I pieced together while trying to figure out where to go do our research in Fukushima in 2011. Uh, yeah, we really had no idea uh, and we didn't have a very good idea of how the uh, contaminants had been dispersed across the landscape. And so we made use of, of these uh, citizen science surveys where people would drive around with a Geiger counter strapped to the side of their car and a data logger and a GPS. And uh, so many of the early maps were generated in this way. And, and they provided a, 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 pretty, a, a pretty good uh, sort of uh, visual of, of where the contamination lay. So anyway, uh, getting back to the um, the real story for today is um, is the fact that uh, uh, let's just to, to wrap up the introduction here. Um, you know, although the Earth is generally shielded from most sources of radiation in the universe, uh, we do have our own. Uh, geological activity going on that, uh, you know, radionuclides in, in, in the, the core of the earth that are generating uh, small amounts of, of uh, radioactivity uh, that, that do affect the natural environment, although not to any large degree that, that we've been able to see, but, uh, but it is measurable and significant biologically. Uh, but uh, but we do have uh, we have added considerably to to the radioactivity the background radioactivity on the planet through through atomic bomb testing uh, through um, medical practices but also through these large scale nuclear accidents and um, and and I would argue that we you know we need to uh, study the consequences of this uh, additional mutagen in the environment and. Uh, and what better place on the planet to study this than, than Chernobyl? And, uh, 
And I have here a photo of one of my study sites uh, in behind uh, one of the cooling ponds that are one of the cooling towers that was never completed from reactor number six at Chernobyl. It's not a it's not a photo that most of the tourists take, so <laughs> but it shows a uh, a mist net, a mist net which is used to uh, uh, catch birds uh, and sometimes bats at night. And uh, and this uh, you know we they caught many birds in this this area. Um, I did want to put in a little plug for uh, a recent paper that we've uh, that 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 has come out in the annual review of ecology, evolution, and systematics, uh, which summarizes uh, many of the points that uh, and 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 much more that uh, that I'll mention today. But uh, yeah, let me uh, let's see here. You know, basically. I'm going to just quote from this because it really uh, captures the essence a little better and, and perhaps people can read it. Um, but, you know, radioactive light landscapes like Chernobyl offer a largely unexplored opportunity to study fundamental evolutionary processes in the face of mutagens. You know, as, as mentioned earlier on, the world is generally a radioactive place, but for the most part, radioactivity levels are too low for effective and affordable studies. So even where there are large amounts of contaminants uh, or large amounts, measurable amounts of radionuclides, um, their, their levels are, uh, you know, again, they're, they're so low that it doesn't allow for easy experimentation or, or monitoring because sample sizes are too low and the effects are too small. Uh, and, and it would just require too large, a, too large an experimental design to be able to really tease out these low dose effects. Uh, but here at Chernobyl, you know, we have uh, 2,000 square kilometers of radiation levels that span the full range from relatively, you know, natural background levels of the area, which are quite low, uh, you know, because of the geology of the region, not a lot of bedrock, uh, the, uh, the actual natural background levels uh, in, in this region are, are extremely low, 0 0.03 microsieverts per hour if you're using a, a Geiger counter, uh, and, and, you know, uh, but but in some parts of the red forest, for instance, especially right after a forest fire, uh, the doses can be in excess of one millisievert an hour. Uh, again, a millisievert per hour is an extremely high dose rate, and it translates into an annual dose of about nine sieverts, which is, you know, more than two times the the lethal the fifty percent lethal dose, the LD fifty for humans, and so. Uh, you know, so it goes from very, very low to, to uh, you know, to really uh, um, um, extremely, uh, <laughs> extremely high, dangerously high. Uh, and because of the way that the radioactivity is dispersed across this landscape, it's, it's you know, it's very heterogeneous. There's small and large islands of high and low contamination all across this zone. And what this means is that one can do experiments, one can do studies that have large amounts of replication uh, for both the treatment and control. Uh, one can use factorial sampling designs uh, that, again, uh, are not generally available for, for studies of carcinogens or mutagens uh, because they're so dangerous. But here in Chernobyl, they're already there. And so we can make, we can make good use of this uh, to, to basically uh, identify uh, to, to vary the intensity of selection with respect to ionizing uh, across large geographic scales. And, and this really is, again, the perfect setup for ecological and evolutionary studies. It's, uh, and, and so, you know, we've attempted to take, take advantage of this uh, as much as we can. Um, let's see here. All right. Um, so anyway, um, it, it, the other thing that we have here because of the size, um, you know, we, we, we really have this, this system, uh, this very unique opportunity to look at genetic processes, evolutionary processes, mutation selection balance in particular uh, in a, in a, in a multi-species complex environment over multiple generations. And again, this, this is just a unique opportunity. Uh, and so, you know, because of this, we, we can actually start to potentially get at really important fundamental evolutionary questions related to how genetic variation is maintained and, and more importantly, how it's eroded and eliminated. Uh, since we know that most mutations are, are neutral or deleterious, 
uh, you know, most mutations do not bestow any advantage to the to the carrier of the mutation. Uh, it allows us to look at questions related to sex and recombination. Uh, and, and of course, it allows us to get at fundamental questions related to population viability and extinction. Uh, I'm very sorry I missed I missed Mike Lynch's talk earlier today, but uh, it was a bit too late or a bit too early for me. But anyway, uh, here we have it. So let's just start again with uh, a, a brief review of, of what we found and uh, what, what's been found, not just by us, but by others. And, uh, um, and, and you know, one way, one way to capture the essence or the sort of the prevailing uh, uh, findings from a given fi field or a given, for a given set of questions or a given hypothesis is to do a meta-analysis to, to essentially take all that is known, all that's been published, and uh, put that all together in, in a statistically rigorous manner, and and uh, and and to look for general patterns. And 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 this approach is you know being used more and more often because it does provide a way to to assemble uh, and complement uh, the diversity of, of of studies that are out there. Uh, and so we 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 address this question of uh, just. Are there consequences uh, for genetic damage? Is there genetic damage? Is there, uh, you know, mutational effects of the radionuclides uh, and the radiation stemming from the radionuclides at that at the levels that we see in Chernobyl? Uh, we we kind of we kind of thought uh, a priori that that would be likely, but but no one had really summarized this this information particularly effectively. Uh, we'd actually written a review. Uh, my partner and I had written a review 15 years earlier, well, 10 years before this paper, uh, where we took about 30 papers, but we didn't do any kind of rigorous statistical analysis. We found that most of those studies found evidence for genetic damage, but but there was they hadn't you know been put together very well. So we we actually uh, went to the next step and and, uh, and and compiled all of the all of the studies that we excuse me, we could find that uh, related to this question and, uh, and and did the hard work of converting them so that they were compatible for a statistical analysis. Uh, and, uh, and, and here, here is just sort of the summary of, of the, of the, of the data set. And, and, and it's a little bit, uh, you know, perhaps it's a little complicated or a little bit opaque to some people, but basically it's much simpler than it looks. Um, this is really just a, a plot uh, ranked from, from small to, to large of the effect sizes on organisms of all sorts, plants, animals, microbes, related to radiation exposure in Chernobyl. And so everything above this line to the right of this line over here shows a significant impact on rates of mutation or some other measure of genetic damage, i.e. proxy for genetic damage. And many of the effect sizes are very large. Uh, far and away, the bulk here are, are in this positive territory here uh, in terms of increased genetic damage. Uh, just a very few are, are, are either neutral or, or, or negative, uh, which is what you'd expect just by chance alone. So again, overwhelming, this is just overwhelming support for the fact that radiation is a carcinogen or is, is a mutagen. And, and of course, that's not very surprising to, to most people. Uh, what's surprising is the amount of, uh, uh, of resistance to this notion uh, that exists in, in, in some, some parts of the community, the radioecology community. So anyway, uh, this was the first time this had been done. And I think it uh, was fairly effective. I should mention that there's a, there's a study uh, that's in, uh, I think it's in review or about to be in review that repeats our, our analysis, but in a much better way, stronger way, uh, and uh, found basically the same conclusion. So, uh, so, so we have direct effects on DNA. Um, the next, you know, the next level might be for, you know, in terms of biologically is to look at, you know, proxies sort of substitutes for, for level genetic damage at, you know, the level of DNA. There are other ways to look at sort of indirect measures and, and, 
you know, one of our one of our preferred methods, um, <laughs> you know, the, so that you don't have to, you know, extract DNA and do whole genome sequencing to, to get at it. You can actually look at certain characters that are, again, directly tied to reproductive fitness, and 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 of course, uh, fertility is is. Uh, relatively easier to measure, certainly easier to measure than, than DNA sequence variation. And so uh, we looked at, uh, again, uh, sperm and, and, and various systems. Uh, you know, again, there's, there's been these reports, you know, showing that, you know, in humans, male fertility has dropped dramatically over the past few decades. No one really knows why. They think it's got something to do with oxidative stress. Uh, but, uh, but again, it, it's in a sort of a general pattern. Uh, and this has even been, it's even been suggested that this could be our demise that, uh, you know, if the males all become infertile, then, then human population growth will be stopped. That's been suggested. I don't personally think that's ever going to happen. But when we look at birds in Chernobyl, uh, and particularly in the most radioactive areas, what we find is that uh, in many areas, uh, particularly the high radiation areas here, uh, again, I apologize for the, for the uh, missing units here, but uh, the, uh, these are areas above 50 microsieverts per hour, or 50 microgray per hour, uh, again, relatively high doses. Uh, up to 40% of the males were completely sterile in this environment. And again, just a few miles away, a few kilometers away in relatively clean areas, males were perfectly normal. They showed very uh, normal levels of, of fertility and, and measured by sperm production. And so this is, uh, again, direct effects on fertility for males. Uh, we've since uh, repeated these studies using rodents, uh, small bank voles in particular. Uh, we we're not the first to do this. Uh, there was a study in 1991, actually, by Cristaldi that showed high frequencies of normal sperm and bank bulls living in Sweden, where the Chernobyl fallout had landed. And of course, there are folks, uh, Goncharova and, uh, and, and uh, uh, Raya Bokan uh, and others from Belarus uh, have studied this quite, um, quite extensively and again found effects on, on sperm. Uh, a group in Finland, uh, headed up by Tapio Mapes, uh, and one of his students, uh, Kati Kibasari, uh, have again found changes in the performance and morphology of the sperm uh, related again uh, to the to the exposure in a dose uh, dependent manner. So the uh, yeah, it's really quite uh, uh, strong. There are effects on gametes uh, in the animals, and of course, plants have gametes too. Plants have sperm. <laughs> one should have the right to carry weapons outside the home under the Constitution. Religious rights. There's a case from Maine involving particular restrictions on taxpayer aid to religious schools. Under the state law, Maine's administrative... Uh, I, somebody, Sergey, what's going on, Sergey? I hear some sound from other places. Uh, I guess people, people not talking should mute. Thank you very much. Uh, so plants have uh, pollen, uh, male gametes as well, uh, including uh, uh, most, uh, most obviously pollen. And, uh, and again, this is a very effective proxy for genetic damage. And uh, we've looked at, again, hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of pollen grains and, 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 uh, and looked at their viability. Uh, we've looked at the seeds and again, the uh, pollen are, um, Show signs uh, again of exposure with 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 much less much lower viability in the more radioactive areas, and what's really interesting uh, is that here is some evidence, uh, not very strong evidence, but evidence nonetheless that that the uh, that there's some kind of evolutionary response occurring in Chernobyl. Uh, in Chernobyl, in the in the initial years, uh, you know, pollen viability was 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 dramatically. Uh, impacted, but, but it's risen quite a bit, although it's still much lower than it should be. Pollen are, are usually pretty viable, but, uh, but uh, and there's a lot of variation among species and among individuals in the viability. But when we, when we look at Fukushima at the year, you know, they wanted, you know, the years immediately after the accident, again, rel rel rather dramatic effects on pollen viability and and you know again we're postulating we're hypothesizing that this change this difference here relates to 
an adaptive and evolved adaptive response. Uh, so there, maybe not adaptive response, but but the result of selection, removing the genotypes that are most vulnerable to the um, the effects of radiation. Uh, and and we found that this, of course, this also influences uh, the pollen viability. Also influences seed viability. Although interestingly enough, uh, we've been We've been experimentally manipulating seeds from from these plants from Chernobyl, uh, using uh, very 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 large doses of, of heavy ions, mostly uh, ions of iron, uh, and uh, and and found that seeds once they are formed, once they're 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 packed together, actually are extremely resistant to to the effects of of radiation. Uh, unbelievably resistant, but uh, but we haven't published that yet. We'll get we'll get to that soon. Cancer again, uh, running out of time here, so I'm going to wrap this up soon. But but again, the first thing everybody thinks about when you think of radiation well, is cancer. Is somebody talking to me? Um, I. I <laughs> Okay, sorry. Uh, but anyway, we see that uh, again, lots of lots of evidence for the effects of radiation on cancer uh, in Chernobyl. Again, we see many, many, much, many, much evidence of, of increased cancer rates in the animals living in the more radioactive areas. Uh, and uh, again, these sorts of things are never seen uh, in natural populations. Although one could argue that. Uh, a wild animal that has cancer is unlikely to survive very long and is unlikely to be seen uh, once it uh, once its 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 performance its viability is reduced. Anyway, the uh, much evidence of this uh, again um, uh, increased sort of mutagenic effects both in somatic cells and and in germ cells. Um, Again, you know, again, a classic hallmark of radiation effects comes from um, studies of atomic bomb survivors, where cataract in the eyes uh, again was was uh, observed at a very high frequency. And uh, when we look at the wild animals in Chernobyl, again, we see elevated rates of of, of cataract in 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 the eyes. But it's not just the eyes. We also find that uh, the uh, uh, many other animals are uh, showing, the rodents in particular, are showing, again, increased rates of cataract, especially as the animals get older. Uh, we, we, there was an interesting experiment uh, that we conducted a few years ago where we took bank bowls from uh, radioactive areas and relatively clean areas uh, and, and looked at them when they were young. And, and there was no difference in the uh, relatively small differences in the frequency of, of cataract. But we let them, we brought them to the lab and let them live for uh, about a year under uh, optimal conditions. And interestingly, after this, that length of time, uh, one to two years, uh, the incidence of cataract increased dramatically, but only in the voles that were collected from uh, the radioactive areas that had had that exposure uh, early in their development. Uh, you know, again, brain effects. And I guess, again, I guess we probably want to leave some time for, for questions. But uh, again, just to point out that uh, we've learned an awful lot from the exposure of human beings to large doses of, of radiation from, uh, again, from following the atomic bomb survivors in Japan. Uh, and, and, you know, one of the unexpected or Perhaps it was expected. Consequences were were effects on, on neurological development that led to uh, smaller brain sizes and reduced cognitive ability, especially in the children that were in utero at the time of the of the exposures. And uh, and again, uh, although many of the studies from Chernobyl and more recently from Fukushima suffer from uh, small sample sizes and lack of <laughs> replication and and the usual sort of statistical problems related to field studies. Uh, again, uh, using birds as our model, uh, where we actually have managed to get reasonably high sample sizes and, and managed to replicate it over multiple sites. Uh, this again has found that uh, has led to the finding that 
again, neurological development uh, is impaired. And we see it in the birds, we see it in uh, the, uh, the mammals as well. And, and, and the mammals, the small mammals, uh, voles and mice uh, from both Chernobyl and Fukushima, again, show uh, what are what is evidence for, again, uh, effects of this exposure on the developing brains. So um, in summary, many effects of radionuclides on phenotype, other effects seen on fertility, uh, I didn't, um, especially on the males, well, I didn't have time to show you the, the data for the females, but there, again, uh, many studies showing effects on females, certainly many effects on survival and longevity in natural systems. Uh, in other words, uh, we're very likely, these, these very likely add up to effects on individual fitness uh, for the individuals that, that are exposed to these high levels. Uh, and and this, is, this is perhaps one of the main reasons that many populations uh, show lower abundances in the areas of, of high contamination. Uh, they, you know, the, the, some of the populations appear to be quite normal and, you know, indeed it's been suggested that, that some are thriving and, and one could argue that they're thriving in these areas of relatively low contamination. Uh, but, but the evidence shows that they're not thriving in areas of higher contamination. And overall biodiversity or species richness in various different dimensions is significantly lower for many groups in these areas of high contamination. So from an evolutionary standpoint, we appear to have lots of selection going on. We seem to see, you know, many, you know, the fitness is affected in a dramatic way. And, and though, and thus one might expect that there would be an evol evolutionary response to this in the form of adaptive evolution. And uh, uh, given all this selection and, uh, and so again, a few years ago, we decided to, to again, look at the evidence for or against this, this hypothesis. And unfortunately, uh, our, our, you know, basically we found that there was really, there was only one or two studies that, that showed any kind of convincing data uh, related to adaptation to, in a positive way, to this radioactive landscape. Uh, most of the studies that, that have purported to, to, to investigate this uh, suffered from uh, tremendous, um, <laughs> small, tremendously small sample sizes and lack of replication. Uh, you know, one, one study site in a hot area and one study site in a cold area and, and, it, and basically no power to really test these hypotheses. And so, so there needs to be more work in this area, I guess, is, is really uh, the bottom line. But yeah, Chernobyl, great place, the only place to, to make these kinds of studies. So let me uh, just end there and uh, again, uh, just uh, list off the uh, uh, basically almost, you know, hundreds of people that, that have helped over the years to, to put all these data together, uh, especially my uh, research partner uh, for the past 20 plus years, uh, Andres Pape Muller. And, uh, and with that, I will, I will end and uh, go back to you. Thank you very much.